Hello, and welcome to the first episode of Gods and Monsters. On this channel, we will explore the mythology and cosmology of various cultures and faiths. This is the first episode, not just of this channel, but of my series on Norse mythology, a subject I truly love and cannot wait to explore with all of you. The mythical world of the Norse is a fascinating one, one filled with magic and heroes, gods and monsters, and one that has had a profound impact on modern popular culture and literature, from the massively popular comics and films of Marvel to the marvellous world of J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of The Lord of the Rings. And though time separates us from those distant days of the Norse, who we might call Vikings, their tales and myths live with us still. Tales of Odin, the Allfather, of Thor, the Thunderer, and Loki, the Trickster. All tales that we will explore in this series. But the best place to start is at the beginning. And that will be the subject of this episode, the creation myth of the Norse. How their vast and wondrous world came to be. Now before we get started, I will say that these stories come from a variety of sources separated by gulfs of distance and time. Naturally, as is often the case with mythology, not everything will make sense, and not everything is fully accounted for. After all, these are tales from the distant past, and were written by many hands, with some works contradicting others. But regardless, I have done and will continue to do my best, and I shall tell these stories as well as I can, and in a manner that I hope will captivate you. A little bit of the storyteller lies in every tale they tell, and to that end my account may differ slightly from others, but overall, I have tried to be as faithful as I can be to the original sources, which I will cite in the episode's description. And, uh, some of these pronunciations are tricky, and translations vary, so bear with me. So, with all that out of the way, settle in, perhaps grab a warm drink, and let me tell you a story. Our story. The story of how everything came to be. It begins in ice and fire, in a time before the earth, the heavens, the stars and mankind, a time before gods and heroes, a time of punishing heat and biting cold. In the beginning, there were two realms hanging in the vast emptiness. In the south lay the realm of Muspel, the land of fire forever burning in the darkness. In the north was Niflheim, a desolate realm of ice and snow eternally shrouded by freezing mist. Separating the realms of Muspel and Niflheim was a vast gulf, a void called Ginungagap. In the heart of the realm of Niflheim is a spring known as Havergalmir, and from this spring flows eleven rivers, the Elivagar, which cut across Niflheim carrying a poison with them. These rivers stream endlessly over the edge of the frozen realm into Ginungagap. In Muspel, the realm of fire, stands a being known as Surtur, waiting at the edge of the realm where the drifting mists of Niflheim meet the flames of Muspel. Surtur is ancient beyond reckoning, an immense volcanic being wielding a flaming sword which burns brighter than a sun. There, at the edge of the realm, in the oldest region of Muspel, Surtur waits patiently. Though this is only the beginning, Surtur waits for the end, for the final war, for Ragnarok, when he will finally set forth and destroy the gods, engulfing all of reality in fire. Until then, that distant day, Surtur waits. In Ginungagap, into which the waters of Niflheim and the molten magma of Muspel pour, a realm began to form. The waters pouring from Niflheim were heavy with poisoned ice, and eventually the entire northern reaches of Ginungagat were covered with ice and rime and lashed by cold wind. In the south, where the magma of Muspel had poured, the land glowed with a punishing volcanic heat. But in the middle, between these two extremes, a measure of comfort could be found. The cold wind blowing from the north met the hot air of the south and formed a gentle warmth, like the mild breeze on a summer evening. And it was here that life took shape. Ice began to thaw, and in the drops of water, life quickened and took the form of a sleeping giant. This giant was called Ymir, 
and was the ancestor of all giants that would come after. The Emir was gigantic beyond comprehension, neither male nor female, and utterly evil from its very first breath. As Emir slept, life congealed beneath its left armpit. A male and a female, and another six-headed male was formed from Emir's legs. These were the first of the Jotnar, or devourers, beings that we call giants, and like their creator Emir, who they called Argulmir, they were cruel beings. From that same water that had formed Emir emerged a cow. Similarly gigantic, this hornless beast licked the salty ice for nourishment, and from her udders flowed four rivers of milk. Emir nourished itself upon these rivers, and named this cow Aldumla. As Aldumla licked the salty ice and Emir drank her milk, something remarkable was revealed. One day, Aldumla's licking tongue uncovered hair protruding from a block of salty ice. On the next day, Aldumla's licking revealed a man's head. By the evening of the third day, Aldumla had uncovered an entire man. His name was Buri, and he was the ancestor of the gods. Buri was beautiful in form, powerful and tall. Buri fathered a son, called Bor. From the frost giants, Bor took a wife, named Bestla, daughter of Bolthor. And from Bor and Bestla's union were born three sons, Odin, the eldest, Vili, the middle child, and Ve, the youngest of the trio. These three were the first of the Aesir, the gods of the first pantheon. The three brothers grew to manhood in Ginungagap, a miserable place, for this was a time before the earth, before the heavens, before the grass and the stars and seas and sand, a desolate place. To the north was Niflheim, and to the south was Muspel, and both spelled death for the brothers, unable to endure the extreme cold or heat. The brothers grew dissatisfied, as I suppose we all would. They grew to hate Ymir and its unruly offspring, the Frost Giants. And one day, they decided that they could no longer exist in this place between places, and by their combined might, they killed Ymir. A deluge of blood poured from Ymir's immense body, drowning all of the Frost Giants save for Ymir's grandson, the giant Bergulmir, and his wife, who escaped by clinging to a box and riding upon the tide of gore. All giants henceforth are descended from Bergulmir. Triumphant, Odin, Vili, and Ve hoisted Ymir's body onto their shoulders and bore it to the centre of Ginungagap. There, they carved apart Ymir's corpse and created the world we live in today. From Ymir's flesh, they created the earth. From its titanic bones, they crafted the mountains. From its teeth, its jaws and splintered bone, they shaped the rocks and boulders and stones. From Ymir's gushing blood and salty sweat, the brothers filled lakes and seas. So much blood flowed from Ymir that the brothers created a great ocean, vast and violent so that no sane man would dare cross it. And they ringed the earth with this ocean. The brothers raised Ymir's skull to the sky and created the heavens, with each of the four corners of Ymir's skull stretching to the ends of the earth. Gathering together sparks from the flames of Muspel, the brothers cast the stars into the sky. Some are fixed in place, while others travel their own path through the heavens. And those clouds that drift lazily through the sky, they are what remains of Ymir's brains, flung into the sky by its killers. The brothers were pleased with their work. From death had come creation, a land that could be inhabited by all creatures. Though, they knew that they could not all live in peace, and thus did the brothers separate the lands. The coastal land of Jotunheim, bordering the deep and unforgiving sea, was given to the giants, the children of Bergulmir. Giants come in many sizes. Some are no taller than men, while others are as large as mountains though they are all beings of great power, and should thus be avoided by us mortals. Next, the brothers created a land safe from the giants, in the centre of the world. They used Ymir's eyelashes to create a vast wall around this land, and called it Midgard, and this is where we all live today. 
The sons of Bor looked upon their creation and saw that it was good. The sun warmed the earth, and the ground was carpeted with grass and leeks. Though the work of the gods was not yet finished, for Midgard was empty. Its verdant plains, while beautiful, were left unexplored. Its rivers were teeming with fish, but there was no one there to catch them. One day, Odin, Vili, and Ve were walking on the stony shores of Midgard when they came across two trees. One was an ash tree, and the other an elm. The trees had fallen into the sea somewhere and washed up on the beach. The brothers saw in these two trees opportunity and raised them upright. Odin breathed life into the trees. Vili gave them wits and hearts with which to feel, and Ve bestowed upon them the gifts of hearing and sight so that they may experience the world the brothers had created. And thus were created the first man and woman. The man's name was Ask, and he was crafted from the ash tree, and the woman, made from the elm tree, was named Embla. The brothers clothed their creations, and gave to them the realm of Midgard, in which they may live and raise their children. From the union of Ask and Embla descend all the nations and races and families of mankind, including you and me. Over in Jotunheim, a giant named Na'vi bore a daughter. Born with dark eyes and raven hair, Na'vi named this daughter Night. Night married three times and bore three children. From her husband Nagalfari, she bore a son named Aud. From her second husband Anar, she gave birth to a daughter named Earth. And from her third husband, a descendant of Buri and thus related to the three sons of Bor, she gave birth to a son named Day. Like his father and the sons of Bor, Day was radiant and bright of complexion. Seeing the two, mother and son, so different yet related by blood, Odin gave night and day each a horse-drawn chariot and set them in the heavens to ride around the world. Night and her horse Rimfaxi lead the way. The horse is as dark as its mistress, and its mane is rhymed with frost. Every morning, froth from Rimfaxi's mouth falls to the earth and forms dew upon the ground. Day follows behind Night, and his horse is named Skinfaxi. Also like its master, this horse is radiant, and its mane illuminates the sky and earth as it passes over the world. Meanwhile, in Midgard, a man named Mundilfari fathered two beautiful children. He named his daughter Sol, after the sun, and his son Mani, after the moon. The sun and the moon had been created by the sons of Bor from the sparks of Muspel, along with the stars, and were pulled across the heavens by horse-drawn chariots that had no drivers. Sol married a man named Glenn, though this union would be short-lived. Odin and his brothers, who by this point had sired more Aesir, were angered by Mundulfari's arrogance and snatched away his children. Sol and Mani were placed in the heavens to guide the sun and the moon as the drivers of their chariots. As with night and day, the moon takes the lead. The sun's chariot is drawn by two horses, one called Arvak, meaning early riser, and the other is named Alsvid, meaning swift. The Aesir placed bellows between the shoulder blades of the sun's horses so that they keep cool. Now, you may have noticed that the sun and the moon always seem to be in a great hurry to cross the sky. This is because they are chased by two great wolves. These wolves are named Skull and Hati. They pursue the sun and the moon across the sky, seeking to devour them, and there will come a day when the wolves succeed and the sun and the moon are both consumed and the sky will be red with gore. This will be during Ragnarok, the end of days. And thus it was that the Aesir created the cycle of night and day. While this was occurring, Odin, Vili and Ve had quite forgotten the maggots that had squirmed in Ymir's dead flesh. Seeing these maggots writhing in the dirt, the brothers shaped them and breathed life and will into them as they had with Ask and Embla. And from these maggots came the dwarfs. Dwarfs are similar to humans in form, but they live in the deep places of the world. Under the mountains and hills, in caves and grottos where they craft miraculous things. The leader of the dwarfs was named Modsognir, and his second was named Durin. At the ends of the earth, where the edges of Ymir's skull meet the horizon, 
the sons of Bord placed four dwarfs, who are named North, East, South, and West. With the world now populated by humans, giants, and dwarfs, the Aesir decided to make a place for themselves, a place of mighty fortresses, of shining palaces, of rolling hills and golden halls. They called this place Asgard, and it would be their home. Asgard hangs high over Midgard, the two realms linked by the Bifrost, a flaming rainbow bridge. Asgard and Jotunheim, the realm of the giants, are separated by the Ifing, a mighty river that never freezes over. In Asgard, the Aesir settled, numbering twelve gods and twelve goddesses. Odin, father to mankind and to many of the gods who we call Allfather, stands foremost among the Aesir, residing in the golden hall of Valhalla, watching the deeds of mankind, great and small. Well, I hope you enjoyed my story, our story, the story of how mankind and the world we inhabit came to be. Join me next time, and we'll discuss the great world tree Yggdrasil, under whose boughs we all live, and the nine realms that make up the cosmos. Thank you for listening. I really hope you enjoyed this first episode of my series on Norse mythology, and I dearly hope to see you again next time. In the meantime, take care, and safe travels.